registered for your COVID-19 digital vaccination certificate yet? Vincentians who received their COVID-19 vaccine in St. Vincent and the Grenadines are encouraged to apply for their vaccine certificate. If you are planning on traveling or planning to attend upcoming fully vaccinated events, here are two steps you can follow. Step one, send an email to vaccine certificate at gov.bc with the following documents. One, your COVID-19 vaccination card. Two, photo identification card. Three, passport size photo. This is optional. Step two, be patient and allow for a maximum of 72 hours for the information to be forwarded to your email. Don't forget to check your spam or junk mail. For more information, call 784-451-2183 or the COVID-19 hotline 784-534-4325. Your health, a shared responsibility. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. As a doctor and first responder in the fight against COVID-19, we use the N95 mask to protect ourselves and our patients. We are therefore asking you, the public, not to use or abuse the N95 mask. They are exclusively for medical and nursing personnel. Help us to save you and to save ourselves. Diabetes is among the top three leading causes of death. Are you living with diabetes? If so, you may be at risk for developing complications, especially during this COVID pandemic. Let's tackle this problem by complying with taking your medication increasing your physical activities, increasing eating a balanced and nutritious diet, checking your feet as foot care is important, and contacting your healthcare provider. Remember, diabetes can lead to blindness, amputation, and numerous harmful and life-threatening effects. Protect yourself. Know your numbers. Hearts Movement SVG reminds you to love your body and treat it right. Your health a shared responsibility. spread of viral infections including the flu and COVID-19 by practicing proper hand washing. Follow these simple steps. Remove all jewelry before washing hands. Wet hands using running water. Place liquid soap in hand. Circulate using rotational movements, interlace fingers and repeat switching hands. Wash back of fingers rotating them in the palms. Wash fingertips rotating them in palms. 
wash thumbs using rotational movements. Thoroughly wash hands down to the wrists, rinse hands. Dry with clean tissue. Turn off tap using tissue. Use tissue to open door and discard in bin. A simple act can make a huge difference. Stop the spread of viral infections including the flu and COVID-19 by practicing proper hand washing. This is a message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment. registered for your COVID-19 digital vaccination certificate yet? Vincentians who received their COVID-19 vaccine in St. Vincent and the Grenadines are encouraged to apply for their vaccine certificate. If you are planning on traveling or planning to attend upcoming fully vaccinated events, here are two steps you can follow. Step one, send an email to vaccine certificate at gov.bc with the following documents. One, your COVID-19 vaccination card. Two, photo identification card. Three, passport size photo. This is optional. Step two, be patient and allow for a maximum of 72 hours for the information to be forwarded to your email. Don't forget to check your spam or junk mail. For more information, call 784-451-2183 or the COVID-19 hotline, 784-534-4325. Your health, a shared responsibility. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. As a doctor and first responder in the fight against COVID-19, we use the N95 mask to protect ourselves and our patients. We are therefore asking you, the public, not to use or abuse the N95 mask. They are exclusively for medical and nursing personnel. Help us to save you and to save ourselves. 
diabetes is among the top three leading causes of death. Are you living with diabetes? If so, you may be at risk for developing complications, especially during this COVID pandemic. Let's tackle this problem by complying with taking your medication, increasing your physical activities, increasing eating a balanced and nutritious diet, checking your feet as foot care is important, and contacting your healthcare provider. Remember, diabetes can lead to blindness, amputation, and numerous harmful and life-threatening effects. Protect yourself. Know your numbers. Heart's Movement SVG reminds you to love your body and treat it right. Your health is shared responsibility. The spread of viral infections including the flu and COVID-19 by practicing proper hand washing. Follow these simple steps. Remove all jewelry before washing hands. Wet hands using running water. Place liquid soap in hand. Circulate using rotational movements, interlace fingers and repeat switching hands. Wash back of fingers rotating them in the palms. Wash fingertips rotating them in palms. Wash thumbs using rotational movements. Thoroughly wash hands down to the wrist. Rinse hands. Dry with clean tissue. Turn off tap using tissue. Use tissue to open door and discard in bin. A simple act can make a huge difference. Stop the spread of viral infections including the flu and COVID-19 by practicing proper hand washing. This is a message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment.
have you registered for your COVID-19 digital vaccination certificate yet? Vincentians who received their COVID-19 vaccine in St. Vincent and the Grenadines are encouraged to apply for their vaccine certificate. If you are planning on traveling or planning to attend upcoming fully vaccinated events, here are two steps you can follow. Step one, send an email to vaccine certificate at gov.bc with the following documents. One, your COVID-19 vaccination card. Two, photo identification card. Three, passport size photo. This is optional. Step two, be patient and allow for a maximum of 72 hours for the information to be forwarded to your email. Don't forget to check your spam or junk mail. For more information, call 784-451-2183 or the COVID-19 hotline 784-534-4325. Your health, a shared responsibility. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. As a doctor and first responder in the fight against COVID-19, we use the N95 mask to protect ourselves and our patients. We are therefore asking you, the public, not to use or abuse the N95 mask. They are exclusively for medical and nursing personnel. Help us to save you and to save ourselves. Diabetes is among the top three leading causes of death. Are you living with diabetes? If so, you may be at risk for developing complications, especially during this COVID pandemic. Let's tackle this problem by complying with taking your medication increasing your physical activities, increasing eating a balanced and nutritious diet, checking your feet as foot care is important, and contacting your healthcare provider. Remember, diabetes can lead to blindness, amputation, and numerous harmful and life-threatening effects. Protect yourself. Know your numbers. Hearts Movement SVG reminds you to love your body and treat it right. Your health a shared responsibility. spread of viral infections including the flu and COVID-19 by practicing proper hand washing. Follow these simple steps. Remove all jewelry before washing hands. Wet hands using running water. Place liquid soap in hand. Circulate using rotational movements, interlace fingers and repeat switching hands. Wash back of fingers rotating them in the palms. Wash fingertips rotating them in palms. 
wash thumbs using rotational movements. Thoroughly wash hands down to the wrist, rinse hands. Dry with clean tissue. Turn off tap using tissue. Use tissue to open door and discard in bin. A simple act can make a huge difference. Stop the spread of viral infections including the flu and COVID-19 by practicing proper hand washing. This is a message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment. registered for your COVID-19 digital vaccination certificate yet? Vincentians who received their COVID-19 vaccine in St. Vincent and the Grenadines are encouraged to apply for their vaccine certificate. If you are planning on traveling or planning to attend upcoming fully vaccinated events, here are two steps you can follow. Step one, send an email to vaccinecertificate at gov.bc with the following documents. One, your COVID-19 vaccination card. Two, photo identification card. Three, passport size photo. This is optional. Step two, be patient and allow for a maximum of 72 hours for the information to be forwarded to your email. Don't forget to check your spam or junk mail. For more information, call 784-451-2183 or the COVID-19 hotline, 784-534-4325. Your health, a shared responsibility. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. As a doctor and first responder in the fight against COVID-19, we use the N95 mask to protect ourselves and our patients. We are therefore asking you, the public, not to use or abuse the N95 mask. They are exclusively for medical and nursing personnel. Help us to save you and to save ourselves. 
Diabetes is among the top three leading causes of death. Are you living with diabetes? If so, you may be at risk for developing complications, especially during this COVID pandemic. Let's tackle this problem by complying with taking your medication, increasing your physical activities, increasing eating a balanced and nutritious diet, checking your feet as foot care is important, and contacting your healthcare provider. Remember, diabetes can lead to blindness, amputation, and numerous harmful and life-threatening effects. Protect yourself. Know your numbers. Heart's Movement SVG reminds you to love your body and treat it right. Your health is shared responsibility. The spread of viral infections including the flu and COVID-19 by practicing proper hand washing. Follow these simple steps. Remove all jewelry before washing hands. Wet hands using running water. Place liquid soap in hand. Circulate using rotational movements, interlace fingers and repeat switching hands. Wash back of fingers rotating them in the palms. Wash fingertips rotating them in palms. Wash thumbs using rotational movements. Thoroughly wash hands down to the wrist. Rinse hands. Dry with clean tissue. Turn off tap using tissue. Use tissue to open door and discard in bin. A simple act can make a huge difference. Stop the spread of viral infections including the flu and COVID-19 by practicing proper hand washing. This is a message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment.
registered for your COVID-19 digital vaccination certificate yet? Vincentians who received their COVID-19 vaccine in St. Vincent and the Grenadines are encouraged to apply for their vaccine certificate. If you are planning on traveling or planning to attend upcoming fully vaccinated events, here are two steps you can follow. Step one, send an email to vaccine certificate at gov.bc with the following documents. One, your COVID-19 vaccination card. Two, photo identification card. Three, passport size photo. This is optional. Step two, be patient and allow for a maximum of 72 hours for the information to be forwarded to your email. Don't forget to check your spam or junk mail. For more information, call 784-451-2183 or the COVID-19 hotline 784-534-4325. Your health, a shared responsibility. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. As a doctor and first responder in the fight against COVID-19, we use the N95 mask to protect ourselves and our patients. We are therefore asking you, the public, not to use or abuse the N95 mask. They are exclusively for medical and nursing personnel. Help us to save you and to save ourselves. Diabetes is among the top three leading causes of death. Are you living with diabetes? If so, you may be at risk for developing complications, especially during this COVID pandemic. Let's tackle this problem by complying with taking your medication increasing your physical activities, increasing eating a balanced and nutritious diet, checking your feet as foot care is important, and contacting your healthcare provider. Remember, diabetes can lead to blindness, amputation, and numerous harmful and life-threatening effects. Protect yourself. Know your numbers. Hearts Movement SVG reminds you to love your body and treat it right. Your health a shared responsibility.
call to the performance of important trusts in this land. Let thy blessing descend upon us here in this house assembled and grant that we may treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberation in so just and faithful a manner as to promote thy honor and glory and to advance the peace, prosperity, and welfare of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and of those whose interests thou hast committed to our charge. Amen. Pray be seated. Members, I apologize for my tardy arrival this morning, but as, as I'd indicated to you and my colleagues that I would have been a few minutes late. This morning, Madam Speaker, I advise Her Excellency the Governor General to revoke the appointment of Senator of the Honorable Rochard Bala, who has done human service already to this country, to the government, and to the parliament, and whom I'm absolutely sure would again be in a position to do such service. And I further advise Her Excellency, the Governor General, to appoint Rene, Ms. Rene Mercedes Batiste as Senator. I will speak after the appoint after the formal oath of allegiance more on this matter, Madam Speaker. And I will indicate the reason for the action afterwards. So in, a, in an interest of openness and transparency in accord with the highest principles of representative democracy. I therefore, Madam Speaker, to request of you to invite Ms. Rene Mercedes Batiste to take the oath of allegiance. She having been appointed this morning as Senator by Her Excellency the Governor General in accordance with my advice under the Constitution of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. When I came from Her Excellency, I tendered to you, Madam Speaker, the instruments of her appointment in addition to the instruments regarding the revocation of the appointment of Senator Bala. I also caused to be sent to you, Madam Speaker, in accord with the protocols which you have agreed with, with the Chief Medical Officer, a PCR test this morning done on Ms. Rene Batiste, and that test is negative, and which has been, I've been advised, referred to you already, Madam Speaker. Therefore, there are no impediments for us to proceed to have Ms. Rene Mercedes Batiste sworn in as Senator of this Honorable House. Sergeant at Arms, can you please escort Ms. Rene Batiste into the chamber? Clark. Oath of Declaration. Renee Batiste, 
do solemnly swear that I will truly and bona fide qualify to be elected a member of the House of Assembly of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, according to the true intent and meaning of the representation of the People Act and the rules and regulations made thereon. of allegiance. I, Rene Baptiste, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, that I will uphold and defend the Constitution and the laws of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and I will conscientiously and impartially discharge my responsibilities to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So help me God. Madam Speaker, we have before us a confluence of circumstances of which we are all aware as to the ravages of COVID-19 and all its variants and mutations which have caused a number of honorable members of this house not to be here because they contracted this highly contagious disease. Fortunately, they are all vaccinated and so too, Madam Speaker, is our new senator. And the fact that they are all vaccinated, that has made it rarely for them to be not what we will call sick. Because I've spoken to, to them all and they're doing pretty well. We are happy to welcome back the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries, and Rural Transformation, the Honorable Saboto Caesar, who tested negative yesterday and is back here with us today, and we welcome him and look forward very much to his presentation on his ministry. Sometime today, Madam Speaker, if we get that far into the afternoon or evening, I believe sometime between after five or thereabouts, the Honorable Minister of Education and national reconciliation would be taking his test so that we will see whether he'd be able to join us if we are, if we are still here. Likely that we will still be here. Because there are eight persons here to speak 
Madam Speaker, eight persons constitute a quorum of this House. And in the absence of the opposition, and given the necessity for the passing of this urgent matter, the Appropriation Bill and the Pub Public Sector Investment Bill. I did not want, as leader of the House and leader of the government, to await possibly the return of the Honorable Minister of Education or anyone else today. Certainly, he is up for clearance today. And, and Madam Speaker, we had set ourselves the objective of finishing the bill before this weekend was out. The opposition has indicated, both by their conduct on Wednesday afternoon and subsequently through public statements, that they do not intend to return to the House. In other words, to obstruct and frustrate the business of the people. Well, we have a parliamentary democracy, Madam Speaker, a representative democracy, which rests on the first-past-the-post system in 15 constituencies in 15 elections. That's why it is called general elections. And on, on November the 5th, 2020, these 15 elections took place on one day in a general election. And the people of this country returned the Unity Labour Party to office for a fifth consecutive term with nine out of the 15 seats. We went in with eight, Madam Speaker, from the last parliament, and we came out with nine. None of the seats which we held hitherto was flipped, and we secured a seat from North Leeward, which was in the camp of the opposition in the last parliament. And we cannot have six representatives or the party which is directing them frustrate and obstruct the legitimate business of the people. And particular, Madam Speaker, in light of the fact that inside of these estimates and the appropriation bill are huge sums of money immediately to be utilized for the good of the nation and in particular the poor and the working people and the most vulnerable. And in my presentation, I shall have more to say about those particular new provisions and the new allocations. For Madam Speaker, as I outlined on Wednesday, the opposition were functioning on an entire misapprehension that because the estimates were passed, that the appropriation bill is neither here nor there, and that you can spend all the money which in the estimates. Well, that is not so. In fact, the member for West Kingston on Tuesday in a, I think Tuesday afternoon in a press briefing with the Sorry, on Tuesday, yes, on Tuesday, the press briefing with the leader of the opposition said, what is this 
thing about is hasty. The money is already in the, in the estimates. It's passed. They can spend the money. That is not so. They haven't read properly the Financial Administration Act. Because no new capital program can have an ex any expenditure drawn there from, Madam Speaker. And there are several of them across many, many ministries touching and concern the welfare of the poor, the working people, the vulnerable, and the nation as a whole. And we cannot wait any day longer to have both the appropriation bill passed and the public sector investment loan act bill, which is to raise $125 million to finance the capital budget. So both of them going hand in hand. And I want to say this, Madam Speaker, they may wish to turn up now, and that is fine with me, but I want to make it clear that I intend to finish this bill today and if need be into tomorrow so that by Monday both bills could be assented to by the Governor General and published promptly in the Gazette. I will not tarry on the government's business, particularly where large sums are involved of new monies for the people, the working people, the poor, the vulnerable, and the nation as a whole. I will be irresponsible if I were to do that. Madam Speaker, I had given the assurance that we will pass the bill. You may recall that. I gave that assurance. And the Constitution is written in a manner to permit precisely what we have done here today in the circumstances, in the factual circumstances. And just in case, Madam Speaker, there, is, there are additional leeways. There is one other senator who tested positive, and I can act in that regard also under the Constitution. But there's no necessity so to do now because we have before us a quorum and hopefully it will be added to this evening if all goes well with the Honorable Minister of Education, Minister of Education in respect of the test. Madam Speaker, this idea of people trying to make the politics out of COVID is despicable. And to rejoice about people who get COVID, I mean, this is entirely, I want to use a word, but I'd restrain from using it and simply say that it is wholly wrong to do so. I think we are very fortunate, Madam Speaker, that a very distinguished lawyer, former parliamentarian, former minister of government, the Honorable Senator Rene Mercedes Batiste, who served in this parliament as the representative for West Kingston from 2001 to 2010. And she did a very distinguished work as a minister. And since then, she has been in the leadership of many areas of work, including professional work, that the lawyers have reposed confidence in her as the president of the Bar Association. 
she's a person of the highest quality. And when I spoke to her about this matter, she agreed readily. She also, Madam Speaker, indicated that during the time she's a senator, even though she's not required to do so, she would demit her office as chairman of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Electricity Company. And she has so sent her resignation from the chairmanship of that body already to me. I congratulate her. She told me that she has been following the debate with great interest from the pronouncements by the Minister of Finance on Monday, and I look forward very much for her own comments in these proceedings. They are not new proceedings to her. She's an old hand at it. I want to thank former Senator Rashad Bala, who is a splendid young man, whom I have the highest regard for, and I have great confidence in him. But he understood that we all have to get the people's work done in the exigent circumstances. So I would like very much to congratulate Senator Rene Batiste. I want to say this, Madam Speaker, to my brothers and sisters who are in the Seventh-day Adventist faith, we know that Friday from sundown to Saturday evening sundown, their Sabbath. And it is the first time, Madam Speaker, I'm very careful about this. We have never, under our leadership, encroached on their Sabbath time. We have no one on our side who is a member of the Seventh-day Adventist faith here. We have had several in the past. In any event, Madam Speaker, I want them to appreciate that I pondered the question raised in the book of Luke. The Sabbath made for man or man for the Sabbath? And considered in all the circumstances that metaphorically the appropriation bill was like the ox that had fallen in the ditch. And if it is necessary, and both necessary and desirable for us to take that ox out of the ditch on the Sabbath day, I think my brothers and sisters would agree with me that this is something done worthy and in the spirit, the letter of the book of Luke. I am hopeful that we will have a fruitful debate. Madam Speaker, I want to emphasize this point, that all it required was one member of the opposition to come here and sit. Once the Minister of Agriculture had been cleared, for us to have the quorum. They could have voted against it. They didn't have to talk if they didn't want to talk, but not to be obstructionists but they have chosen an anti-people path, an anti-national path, and the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, under my leadership, would not allow us to be obstructed in this manner. And with that, Madam Speaker, we have our debate to do. The more I will say, and I'm sure other members will have things to say. 
but I suspect, Madam Speaker, in the usual way, we will invite our new senator to say something. I don't want to encroach upon your, your own role, Madam Speaker, but I think that is the usual thing. And um, I so request that she be given an opportunity to respond to her latest appointment. I'm obliged. Honorable Senator Rene Batiste. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, honorable members. When I received the call to service, I was a bit silent and then I told the leader of government business in this honorable house, the honorable prime minister, certainly. He then asked if I had been tested. I said, Monday I was tested and negative and I plan to take a second test today. Fortunately, I have tried my best to comply with the protocols and the laws relating to this pandemic that we are suffering here in St. Vincent as elsewhere in the world. And my PCR test and antigen test this morning, both were negative. So I was able to inform the Honorable Prime Minister that certainly I will accept the appointment as Senator. I thank him for considering me to be able to continue this service in the interest of the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. You see, sometimes, Madam Speaker, things will happen and you have to be like a good soldier, always be ready when called upon to give service. and to do the best in the circumstances. And we have a situation which requires me to be here today, and I am here reporting for duty on behalf of the people of this country. I am looking forward once again to whatever time I may have here in the Parliament to participate in the debate and to be able to bring to bear the experience that I've had for almost 10 years serving in an elected capacity as a representative of the people and also as a senior member of the cabinet to be able to give my advice to my fellow members of parliament. These are serious times, Madam Speaker, and requires application and support. While I may speak from time to time with honorable members, and having had this opportunity now presented to me, I shall continue to do so to the best of my ability I want to, before I even make a contribution, perhaps later, if so time permits, to compliment and congratulate the Honorable Minister of Finance on the excellent budget that he has presented in this parliament. And I'm hoping, sitting here today, to have a little closer look at certain matters which are of deep interest to me, that I'll be able to have that opportunity to make a short contribution. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Thank you, Honourable Members. Madam Speaker, obliged. I think we're at a fitting point now where we can continue the debate. Madam Speaker, before we begin the debate, out of an abundance of caution, we may be here after 5 o'clock. I think we, we probably will be here after 5 p.m. I beg to move on the standing order 12-5, that the proceedings of today's sitting be exempted from the provisions of the standing order hours of sitting. Second. Honorable members, the question is that the proceedings of today's sitting be exempted from the provisions of the standing order's hours of sitting. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. 
As many as are of the contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. I recognize the Honorable Senator Morgan. Senator Morgan, you request the podium. Yes, yes. Madam Speaker. Senator Morgan, you have 45 minutes. Madam Speaker, I am pleased to stand here today to make my contribution to this year's debate on the appropriation bill in this Honorable House. I wish to extend my sincere congratulations to the Honorable Senator Batiste on her appointment. I look forward to serving in this capacity with her in the House. Madam Speaker, 2021, the year 2021, was a very challenging year, but we have overcome them. We have literally risen from the ashes to the challenges, and we are here today. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, being a small island developing state with a small open economy, has always been prone to external environmental and economic shocks. However, this year has been unprecedented. We are living in unprecedented times. Our country has never had to battle the socioeconomic challenges of the global economy, the effects of a global pandemic, and the devastation caused by the La Sofre volcano and Hurricane Elsa at the same time. These challenges have really highlighted how vulnerable we are as a country. We can learn many lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic and the last of rare eruption. Primarily, the importance of being flexible and adaptable to the challenges that we face. This is important because in the blink of an eye, circumstances can change. Nobody could have anticipated exactly how disruptive COVID could, would have been in terms of lives lost, jobs lost, the longevity of it, the mutations and variations of this virus. It seems as if, it seems as if we went to, went, went to bed one night thinking that this was just some weird virus over in China, and then we woke up and it was on our doorstep bringing us to our knees. Similarly, in the blink of an eye, many persons in the red zone in the north of the island had to flee from the Lassifre volcano. Many were evacuated with just the clothes on their backs. All the assets they worked hard over the years to accumulate, their homes, their animals, their valuables, had to be left behind. In the end, entire communities were devastated. Given our propensity to external shocks outside of our control, the logical process then is to direct our focus to mitigating the accompanying hardships and suffering when they occur. The vast majority of Vincentians are listening to the budget debate now, I presume, because they are concerned about what the government is doing to mitigate the twin challenges of the COVID pandemic, as well as the effects of the La Sofre volcanic eruption, the damage, the displacement, and the destitution. This is the context in which I am going to debate this year's appropriation bill. I'm choosing to focus on the policies and programs that help the most vulnerable persons who are hurting on account of their current socioeconomic status, on account of COVID, and on account of the volcano eruption. I'm also going to explore a few policies for self-sufficiency and poverty reduction. 
Madam Speaker, what exactly is the government doing to help Vincentians? Well, apart from not implementing any new tax measures for the fiscal year 2022, and apart from the policies to drive economic growth, and apart from the development of our infrastructure, the government's first and most immediate response to the effect of the economic and environmental shocks has been to deploy agile and adaptive social protection policies to mitigate the effects of these crises. Generally, social protection policies are targeted to meet the specific needs of persons living in poverty or extreme poverty, as well as other vulnerable groups, such as children, the elderly, and the disabled. Public assistance is the most common form of social protection in our country. The Ministry of National Mobilization is the biggest agency for public assistance. In this year's budget, $16.5 million has been budgeted for social assistance in cash, while $1.75 million has been budgeted for social assistance in kind in the form of vouchers, food vouchers, and other aid. Funds are available under grants from entities and donor agencies, such as the World Bank, there's a CBD COVID relief, relief fund, as well as UNICEF, to name a few. Madam Speaker, we tend to conflate what is referred to as poor relief in this country with public assistance. However, the, the phrase poor relief, it has a negative connotation, so the term public assistance is used, but what is regarded as poor relief is only one subset of all the public assistance policies in St. Vincent. Public assistance is more extensive than poor relief. There are actually three tiers of public assistance. They are the family support grants, the vulnerability grants, and emergency grants. As the name suggests, the Family Support Grant Program was introduced by the Cabinet in 2020 to help families that are facing poverty, especially those that have been negatively affected by the COVID pandemic. In this country, single-parent households headed by women have been severely impacted by COVID. The data suggests that it is predominantly women who are employed in the informal sectors as well as in the hospitality and tourism industries, and those sectors were most affected by COVID. According to the World Bank reports, the World Bank released a poverty and shared prosperity report of 2020, and they are claiming that the pandemic has actually set back the Millennium Development Goals of Poverty Reduction by an entire generation. Madam Speaker, these are trying times that we face indeed. This government has realized that there must be a holistic approach towards poverty reduction. The government is aware that it will be counterproductive to focus on the immediate human needs without also addressing the issues that created them. Studies have shown that the stress of growing up in poverty can permanently alter the wiring in the brains of developing children. This can lower their resilience and make them prone to not only physical problems such as malnutrition and disease, but also serious emotional and mental health problems, which then translates into the social ills in our society such as crime, sexual assault and abuse, gender-based violence, the list is not exhaustive. The consequence of this is that poverty and other trauma gets recycled from generation to generation. This has wider implications for our society because of the correlation between poverty, unemployment, and crime. The family support grants are structured to support families in a holistic way. The logical strategy to break the intergenerational cycle of poverty is to focus on the obstacles that prevent persons from elevating. These family support grants can either be in cash or in kind. The cash transfers are meant to cover food, basic amenities, and they range from $300 to $640, depending on the size of the household. These are issued monthly. 
Persons enrolled in the family support programs, they also are enrolled in two programs that teach life skills, such as conflict resolution, anger management, parenting skills, money management skills. They are giving them, they are giving them the tools to empower themselves and break the cycle. In 2022, 500 families will benefit from the family support grants. Poverty is very complex, so holistic policies are needed. Because as early as three and four years, when children enter the primary schooling system, the effects of poverty start manifesting. Compared to their middle class peers, poor children tend to fall significantly behind at this stage. When you look at their cognitive development, their ability to read and write and comprehend developmentally, some of them lag behind their middle class peers. When children are hungry and stressed out from the effects of poverty, they can't concentrate. These children are not necessarily slow learners. They just don't live in environments that enable their learning because their parents have limited means, no fault of their own. When children can't read profession, proficiently, and when their math and comprehension skills are weak, they are less likely to pass CPEA, less likely to finish secondary school, less likely to go to university. And then we see the intergenerational cycle of poverty continuing in our society. There's a calypso from the mighty sparrow that I used to hear when I was going to school. I can't sing it right now, but the lyrics go something like this. Children, go to school and learn well. Otherwise, later on in life, you will catch real hell. And this has stuck with me. We want to ensure that all of the obstacles that prevent children from going to school to full employment are reduced, and the social protection policies reflect this. In addition to the family support grants, the Ministry of National Mobilization also provides grants to cover school fees, school uniforms, school supplies, meals, and also transportation assistance. The government's policies such as the family support grants, the back to school grants, and other investments into education are expected to have a high payoff in terms of long-term growth and poverty reduction. Madam Speaker, these are not handouts. These interventions are evidence of the government's commitment to the vulnerable women and children in our society that are facing economic hardship. Madam Speaker, the second tier of public assistance is known as the Vulnerability Grant. It is more commonly known as Poor Relief, and it caters for the elderly, those 65 and above, the disabled, and the medically unfit. These are, there are long-term grants available where these persons receive about $300 monthly, and there are also temporary grants available for elderly persons and disabled who are not on poor relief. Nobody is impervious to misfortune. Anybody could have an accident or a health crisis and become unable to work, and the vulnerability grant could be their only option for survival. This program goes hand in hand with other social protection policies, such as the Home Help for the Elderly program, designed to assist our elderly in their twilight years. In 2022, this year, approximately 4,000 households are going to benefit from the vulnerability grants. This demonstrates the government's love and protection for the elderly, the disabled, and the medically unfit in our society. In addition to these social protection policies, consultations have also begun to implement new legislation by the end of 2022, we should see the development of a draft National Disability Bill and a draft Elderly Care and Protection Act Bill. Sometimes our disabled and our elderly, they're neglected, they're abused, and they're taken advantage of, and these legislations intend to address that. The third and final tier of public assistance, Madam Speaker, is the emergency grant. This, as the name suggests, is meant for emergencies. It is a temporary form of social insurance that caters to the vicissitudes of life. When I was growing up, I knew that my family was poor, but we would not have been classified as poor under the Public Assistance Act because my mother at the time was employed as a clerk typist with the government, 
and my father was a mid-level civil servant, but we were in different households. In our household, my mother's salary of $1,200 could barely pay her mortgage, bills, take care of herself, and two growing girls. Although we needed assistance, we would not have qualified for public assistance because my mother was employed. Effectively, my mother would have fallen into the category of what we would call the working poor. This is the reality of many Vincentians. They are not in a traditional sense poor, but they need assistance, and this is what the emergency grant is designed to do. There are nine types of emergency grants. There is an immediate assistance grant to assist persons facing exceptional circumstances. There are utility grants to cover utility bills. There are fire victim grants. There are building material grants. That is self-explanatory. There are medical grants to pay for doctor's visits and medication. There are funeral grants to assist persons with burying their loved ones. There are food voucher grants. There are basic amenities grants and national disaster grants are also available. These give immediate assistance to persons in the short term until a more permanent solution could be designed to assist them. These policies are not handouts. They provide a cushion for the most vulnerable in our society who may find themselves in extremely desperate circumstances, Madam Speaker. This year, approximately 713 families are projected to benefit from the emergency grants. And this again demonstrates the government's love and protection for the vulnerable persons in our society. Madam Speaker, the current law on the books, the Public Assistance Act, which dictates the administration and the delivery of public assistance is outdated. It was first enacted in 1957, and it was last amended in 1989. This act was drafted for an entirely different era, a colonial era, and it does not adequately reflect the needs of a modern post-colonial society. It has a very narrow focus, specifically poor relief, rent payment, distribution of uniforms, distribution of housing material, this existing Public Assistance Act is based on a welfare model and it doesn't acknowledge the need for different scales of assistance to vulnerable persons in different socioeconomic groups and contexts. Madam Speaker, it is important for me to note that many of the existing programs that I spoke about that widen the scope of public assistance, such as the Family Support Grants, and the emergency grants are a direct result of the policies of this administration, and they are underpinned by the social democratic philosophies of the Unity Labour Party. These are the kind of creative and agile and adaptive solutions that we have come to expect from this government. This government knows that we can't place the burden of escaping poverty solely on the persons experiencing poverty. If we do that, we will be ignoring the origins of poverty. We can't forget that we have a past of slavery and underdevelopment. When we became independent in 1979, we inherited a system that was never created for the welfare and the best interests of our citizens. This system that we have was designed to make England rich. It wasn't designed to develop us. We are still seeing all now the effects of the maladjusted policies of previous administrations. And this is being reflected in our poverty cycle. This government has a growth mindset and will therefore seek to implement better policies to improve the standard of living and the quality of life for Vincentians. Consequently, a number of steps have been taken to accomplish public assistance reform. Last year, consultations have begun to redraft the Public Assistance Act. This government has recognized that in light of the current socioeconomic climate and the projections by the World Bank, there is a need to reform the social protection system to adequately take care of the vulnerable and the poor in this country. 
This new act is going to mark a shift from a welfare model to a social protection model. Vincentians deserve public assistance laws that are responsive to the environmental and economic threats that we face. Vincentians deserve public assistance laws that identify and provide for vulnerable persons. And of course, Vincentians deserve public assistance laws that guarantee a more equitable distribution of the state's resources. Naysayers, I know, they're going to argue that ruling's party supporters disproportionately get the benefits of the state's resources. But ironically, I believe that ruling party supporters believe that opposition supporters receive the lion's share of the state's resources. Both of these assumptions cannot be correct at the same time. And the Lasso Frere relief efforts certainly do not support these contentions. Resources were distributed equitably. Persons who needed assistance got it according to their needs. This is proof that the system can work for the benefit of all Vincentians. The second set of reforms acknowledge that there are more efficient ways to administer public assistance. Under the World Bank HDSD project, that is the Human Development Service Delivery Project, consultations began last year to develop a social assistance management information system. This is because, Madam Speaker, the way that we measure and define poverty has significant implications for how we structure our social protection policies. Poverty is relative and it is compared to the society that we live in and what we consider to be a good standard of living and a good quality of life. Poverty in a sub-Saharan African country and poverty in St. Vincent, of course, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, of course, would have a different profile. The objective of this management information system is to identify and categorize the most vulnerable persons and to assess their needs in order to help them in tangible ways. This is scheduled to be implemented, I believe, later on this year, around June or July. Minister of National Mobilization will expand more on that, I believe, in his presentation. But this is important because this management information system is going to streamline the process of getting public assistance and is going to avoid waste and duplication of efforts across all the tiers of public assistance. Additionally, the management information system is going to provide proof of exactly how public assistance resources are distributed, and this lays the foundation for a more equitable distribution of resources. The public assistance payment system also had revisions. Under the CBD COVID, COVID relief project, a pilot program was started last year where public assistance was distributed via reloadable debit cards. So instead of going to line up to collect your public assistance, persons were given debit cards and the cards were topped up monthly with the public assistance funds. And about 477 persons were able to benefit from this program and this is expected to continue this year. This was not only more convenient for the ministry and the recipients, but it made the process of receiving public assistance a bit more dignified. It was so successful that the aim is to administer cash transfers in this way for other public assistance programs. It has worked so well that St. Vincent is now being used as a model for other Caribbean countries in the delivery of digital public assistance payments. The donor agencies are also very pleased with the administration of the project. The funds go directly from the donor agent into the specified bank account, and then the reloadable ATM cards are then topped up. This will result in greater accountability and greater transparency. And I hope that this would go a long way in silencing those persons who keep accusing the government of political interference in the public assistance process. Finally, there has been a move towards decentralization of the social protection programs. So instead of having to come to Kingston, persons were able 
to access volcano relief at the community level, if not in their own communities, in neighboring communities. This system ensured that approximately 75,000 food packages, toiletries, and other essentials reached the persons who needed assistance the most. The decentralization process was very efficient, it worked very well, and it is going to continue for other aspects of public assistance. Madam Speaker, the face of poverty is changing. The World, Bank, the World Bank's Shared Prosperity and Poverty Report of 2020 predicts that on account of COVID, there is going to be a new category of poor persons emerging. And this is not surprising because the pandemic has significantly slowed down economic growth. They are projecting, however, that the new poor are more likely to be educated less likely to be in rural areas, and less likely to be employed in agriculture. We have to prepare for this. In 2021, last year, the government transferred approximately $15 million in income support to those who lost jobs or income on account of COVID. Some of this money went to entertainers, taxi men, bus drivers, vendors, cat men, and even sailors. Madam Speaker, this is a government that cares about the vulnerable people in our society. This is not a government that favors austerity measures that is going to bind poor people in poverty and underdevelopment. This government didn't implement any lockdown measures because poor people who are already struggling would have been hit the hardest. If businesses had to shut down, a lot of people would have been unemployed and broke. When people are spending less money, the economy slows down because one man's spending is another man's income. The government had to keep money circulating throughout the economy. Yes, health was a priority, but other creative measures were used to stop COVID from spreading. I was surprised on Monday when the Minister of Finance indicated that we had modest growth, modest economic growth of about 0.7% in 2021, last year. This is remarkable given that we had a volcano eruption, we had COVID, we had Hurricane Elsa, and I believe no doubt it was the lack of lockdowns and it was the social protection policies that kept money circulating in our economy. Madam Speaker, with respect to volcano relief, the Minister of Finance went into this in detail in his presentation, and I believe that the Minister of National Mobilization is also going to touch on a lot of the statistics concerning this in his presentation, so I am going to be brief. But this year, there is a projected $11.5 million in the estimates available under the Volcanic Eruption Emergency Project, or VEEP. This is going to provide temporary cash transfers and income support to volcano-impacted persons in the red and orange zones, and approximately 4,000 families are going to benefit from this. Additionally, persons whose homes were damaged, some of them were fixed. Those that could not be fixed, they're going to be relocated to new homes. So any discomfort from the displacement of Sufre, La Sufre, was short-lived. Persons in the shelters were very well taken care of. Even after returning home, persons in the red and orange zones, they still continue to receive support and assistance under the World Food Program in collaboration with the government. Over 3,000 persons were able to benefit from this program. And Madam Speaker, where the government couldn't reach people, I saw ordinary citizens stepping up to fill the gap. Everybody pitched in. And I felt so good to see the unity, the generosity, the camaraderie. And as a result, very few people fell through the cracks. I wish that we could have continued to live like this. But the fact is, our economy is not big enough to guarantee that every single person that needs public assistance will get it. 
Right now, because of scarce and limited resources, there is a cap on the amount of persons who can get public assistance. In an ideal society, we would have a social protection floor, which guarantees a minimum standard of living for every single person in this country. This is aspirational, and we could work towards this. Madam Speaker, it would be a lopsided argument to speak about poverty reduction without also speaking about wealth creation, because wealth creation is a catalyst for self-sufficiency. So while steps are being taken to reform the public assistance system, it's important for us all to be proactive about our own development. Sometimes we could be blindsided by life, but we all have to take responsibility for our lives and our livelihoods, because it is very dangerous to leave that in somebody else's hands. Madam Speaker, I am by no means saying that the vulnerable people in our society should be left to language, or that they should find their way out of their own troubles, or that they should pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Nothing of the sort. What I am saying is that as individuals, we need to take responsibility for our lives and livelihoods and not leave it entirely in the hands of politicians. In St. Vincent, I have seen a culture of dependency and entitlement developing, and it is concerning because it really doesn't empower our people. It creates a scarcity mindset that degenerates into political tribalism and a battle for, for scarce resources between opposition supporters and ruling party supporters. I think that we are better than this. And I want us to aspire to more than this. Now, there are a number of poverty reduction strategies that persons can use to supplement their incomes or to become self-sufficient. First, even if you are not an entrepreneur, you can be enterprising. It is always good to have an additional source of income. I recently had a conversation with a guy who told me that one day he went home, and when he went home, he discovered his wife told him, well, the cooking gas was finished. He didn't have enough cash. The wife said she didn't have any money. But when he, he has a, a small fowl farm, and when he looked around his kitchen, he saw that he had about seven flats of eggs sitting on the, the table. So of course, he took them to sell. He came back, not only with the cooking gas, but with bread, snacks for the children. And on top of all of that, he was able to give his two secondary school children $15 each to take to lunch the next day. He was enterprising, so he told me he was never truly broke. Now this guy, he's employed with the government, earning a steady salary, but he's still finding ways to supplement his income. I give you this example because the government can't teach you to be enterprising. This is something that have to, has to come from inside of you. What the government could do is they could facilitate your enterprise or they could provide resources such as the prime grants to help you along the way. And speaking of the prime grants, this year, $1.4 million has been allocated for startup businesses I think approximately 150 persons are expected to benefit under these prime grants. Our private sector is very weak, and if we want to really drive economic growth in this country, we really need to beef up our private sector, and these prime grants are intended to do this. I understand that we are in hard times and resources are scarce, but there are other avenues such as the cooperatives and the cooperative societies, which also fall under the Ministry of National Mobilization. The word cooperative, it has a Latin root, cooperat, which means simply operating together to achieve certain ends. Persons could pool their resources, the limited resources that you have, you form a cooperative and you invest in enterprises. The same gentleman that I spoke to, he told me about his experience with one of the cooperative societies that own a gas station and other income earning assets in this country. 
He said that he was very strategic about his membership. In addition to purchasing shares, what he started to do, he started to fill up his gas only at that gas station. Members in that cooperative share in the profits of the business, and he realized that the more profitable the business was, the better it would be for him as a member. After his first year of membership, that gentleman told me that he received a sizable dividend. I believe it was over $500. But dividends from profitable cooperatives can not only supplement your income, it can assist in wealth building in the long term. It is also an excellent source of passive income if you're looking to do that, if you're looking to generate passive income. Madam Speaker, we have to be creative with the limited resources that we have. Currently, those consumer cooperatives with a total membership of 396 members, they have total assets worth $7.9 million. Now, if you think that this is out of your reach, I hope that you can, in, can be inspired by the school thrift cooperatives. There are about 88 of them. Those are the junior savers in the schools. And together, those 88 cooperatives have savings of approximately $4.3 million. That's its little children in school. So I am saying this to you because there is power in the cooperatives model. We need to utilize it. I heard the opposition leader speaking, and he was lamenting the challenges that the fisher folk were facing. Right now, there are only five fishing cooperatives. And I think that perhaps this model could be used to strengthen them in their industry. It can help them to purchase boats and equipment. If they collaborate, they can do very well, because fishing is a very lucrative industry. It is one of the few tax-free industries in this country. Fishermen don't pay tax. The cooperatives can be used more in our communities as a form of social insurance as well. Because you can form your cooperative and you can structure it so that it could pay you death benefits, unemployment benefits, sickness benefits. It's really up to you and your partners in that enterprise but we need to be creative and we have to take responsibility for our own lives and livelihoods and find ways to reduce the stress on the government's already limited resources in order to make our people more self-sufficient. In conclusion, Madam Speaker, the government has weathered the storm very well. I think that compared to our neighbors in the OECS, we are the only ones who would have managed to register moderate growth in the year 2021, and this is even despite the challenges that we faced. This budget is our blueprint for the country's economic growth, but we're not just growing to say that we could grow. The aim of growth is ultimately to improve the lives of our people, to improve the quality of life, and the standard of living of our people. The three tiers of public assistance, the family support grants, the vulnerability grants, the emergency grants, along with the other interventions for COVID relief and last affair relief, have helped to really cushion the most vulnerable of us in the society in these trying times. The various public assistance programs and the social protection stimuli have helped to keep money circulating through the economy and they have really helped our people to survive. In the blink of an eye, our circumstances could change. We have very fragile econo economies. We are very susceptible to external economic shocks outside of our control. Given the way climate change is affecting us here in the Caribbean, we are exceptionally vulnerable to natural disasters. And at any minute, in the blink of an eye, without 
without even anticipating it, things can get worse, things that we don't anticipate. So our social protection systems have to be strengthened. And the redrafting of the Public Assistance Act, I think that is going to do that. The economic usefulness of social protection programs in our society, it tends to be overlooked because it does not directly drive economic growth. It does not directly contribute to economic growth. However, every single Vincentian should be concerned about social protections because we are so vulnerable to these external shocks. Madam Speaker, this budget is our blueprint for economic growth. It is in line with our national development plan and it is proof of this government's agile and adaptive policies to the challenges and the effects of the Lassifer volcano, the damage, the destruction, the destitution, and the COVID pandemic. It is not only going to combat our economic challenges, it is going to help to cushion our people and mitigate the effects, the adverse effects that we are currently facing. Madam Speaker, I fully support this year's appropriation bill and I wish it safe passage into law. Further debate? I recognize the Minister of State and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Honorable Minister, you have an hour and 15 minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I must say that the last few days has been very interesting to say the least. And today is no exception. I received numerous calls from persons who appear to be concerned about my well-being and I want to take just a little time to thank them for reaching out and ensuring that I was well. It is by the grace of God and his mercies that we are not consumed and God's strength is always perfect in our weakness. And his mercies are new brand every morning. And he has indeed been faithful to his children. Madam Speaker, at the outset, I wish to congratulate the Honorable Senator Rene Batiste on her appointment this morning. It's, it's a really, I, I don't even know what word to use to describe it. A surreal moment for me because apart from you, Madam Speaker, you have been one of my mentors. The Honorable Senator has also been one of my mentors for years. So I feel privileged to have her here today as I, I make my address to this Honorable House, given her background and her very good standing, Madam Speaker. Congratulations, Senator. Madam Speaker, I also want to take some time to wish my colleagues who are at home, and I know that they're tuned in, a uh, speedy recovery. They report that they're doing well, which is evidence that the vaccine is offering that layer of protection and is minimizing the effects that the virus could have on one's body. 
and I wish them speedy recovery and hope to see them soon so that we could be reunited to do the work of the people. Madam Speaker, I rise today to support the Appropriation Bill of 2022. And I want to congratulate my colleague, the Honorable Minister of Finance, for his excellent presentation on Monday. I listened every single word for the hours that he spoke, and I was very impressed. Madam Speaker, I also want to commend him and his team for doing the unenviable task of crunching the numbers. I often tease him about that, and I wish him Godspeed, but they did it. And when I think about everything that St. Vincent and the Grenadines has been through, we have to continue our quest for economic survival. Madam Speaker, I've reflected on the year 2021, and I made a few observations. One, time did not wait. Two, the multiplicity of challenges did not cease. And three, notwithstanding how we felt at the material time, the Vincentian society and our civilization did not come to an end. So we are here, we're still standing, and as my sister said, we literally have the opportunity to say that we rose from the ashes, Madam Speaker. And in our quest for economic survival and continuity, this budget will assist us in doing just that. Madam Speaker, the ministry for which I am responsible, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, I've said it before, it's a, a dynamic, hardworking ministry. And a lot is said about civil servants, a lot of it negative. And unfortunately, good civil servants are grouped in and generalized with some of the bad apples that may exist. And I remember when I started, many people asked me, Kisal, how is it working with civil servants coming from the private sector? And I said, well, so far, so good. The staff from the permanent secretary down to the office attendant, everybody has been helpful, willing to assist, offering guidance, so far, so good. But to be fair, I'll review in a year's time how that has been, and I will give you an assessment of how it has been. And Madam Speaker, I am happy to report that nothing has changed. In fact, the staff at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade have surpassed my expectations, especially in light of all that we went through in the last year. And I want to publicly put on record my appreciation for them. As I said, they're helpful, they offer guidance, and most importantly, Madam Speaker, they make me the in-house minister and our foreign minister, which is the honorable prime minister, they make us look good. And I want to thank them. I want to put on record, Madam Speaker, that the ministry continues to fulfill its mandate to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And just a refresher, the mandate is to safeguard and promote national interest through foreign policy, trade, and commerce, through our bilateral and multilateral engagements for the sustainable development of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. That is our mandate. And in the last year, we have surpassed that mandate. Madam Speaker, prior to the eruption, the explosive eruption of the Lasso Fre volcano, our ministry was deeply engaged in preparation. And we had multiple meetings with different bodies including the SVG Diplomatic Corps. And we were discussing, one of the meetings I sat in on, we were discussing logistics on safeguarding not only Vincentia nationals, but the many foreign nationals we have living and working here in this great state. And one of the concerns 
that was raised was whether or not the imminent explosive eruption would destroy our communication infrastructure, thereby preventing us from communicating with the outside world. Thankfully, the infrastructure that was damaged was limited to the northern side of the country. But we, in the southern side, the green zone as it is called, we were still able to keep communication open with the outer world. And Madam Speaker, I have to commend the staff because the explosive eruption started on the 9th, the Friday. And on the Saturday, I don't think anybody went anywhere because everybody woke up to the blankets of ash everywhere. On Sunday, I decided to go out in and around my community and I touched base with a few staff members and they said, Minister, we are here at the office. Despite the hazardous conditions, I went to our ministry's office at the financial complex and Madam Speaker, I had goosebumps when I walked in and I saw members of staff walking feverishly to send our diplomatic 